Good afternoon to all. My name is Miss Shirley and I will be your MC for today. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our webinar about how an IB education brings out the best in your child. Before we begin, I would like to explain about the meeting etiquette. First of all, join the meeting. I can see that you have already really done that. Secondly, we will appreciate it if you could mute your microphone. We hope that this would give you a better webinar experience. Thirdly, please pay attention to the presenters. Next, should you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and our speakers will address them at the end of the workshop. Lastly, when you are called, you may unmute yourself and start talking. We would like to thank each and every one of you for following and observing the meeting etiquette. We are very excited to introduce our speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Vincent Chen. He is the principal of Fairview International School, Kuala Lumpur, the top IB school in Malaysia. Dr. Vincent is a, is a winner of a Lifetime Achievement Awards for Education Excellence awarded by the Kingsley Strategic Institute. Our second speaker is Mrs. Lishan Chu. She is an IB parent of a pair of very adorable twins and an advocate of inclusive education. Both of our speakers for today are very experienced in education. Before I pass the screen to the speakers, let's take a look at the four questions that we are going to address in this webinar. The first question is, what is exclusive education and how does it impact your child? The second question is, how does an inclusive education benefit your child? Next question is, how do IB programs promote inclusivity? Lastly, how does inclusive education look and feel from a parent's eye? Dr. Vincent and Mrs. Lishan will address all these questions for us today. Without further ado, it is my honor to present to you our first speaker, Dr. Vincent Chen. Dr. Vincent, the platform is yours. Thank you very much, Shirley. Thank you very much, everybody, for spending the uh, time this afternoon on a Saturday to come and join us uh, and hear what we have to share. So I'm going to begin by sharing with you about the story of John. Now, John isn't anybody in any one of these pictures over here, but it's just a picture of kids. Um, and this is a real story, and John is obviously not his real name, but it's made up. Uh, sorry, the name's made up, but the story's real. So John goes to an exclusive school, um, and his, his particular school, uh, he had to work really hard to get there, passing difficult entrance exams and doing his best every day to make sure his portfolio of activities looked the part. Uh, years been, went by, and in his prestigious school, John became driven by the need to keep up with his classmates in academics, in mannerisms, how everybody has to have a, 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 the same goal to become famous and rich and powerful. And that was really driving him really hard over there. He was taught by his, by his environment that he was privileged because of his talent, his birthright gifts, that his intrinsic advantage had offered him opportunities that other people could not have. And that's what solidified his place at his very prestigious school, his very exclusive environment. He worked as hard as he could and while his grades weren't bad, he always felt he had the need to do better because his personal worth was now tied to the status at his exclusive school. Eventually, John became an adult who had major challenges in life. Beliefs like discrimination were natural to him. Discrimination would mean that beliefs that one group of people were innately better than another, that's what discrimination is, then those became natural to him. He had an endless need to constantly drive to himself to be better than others because it was a measure of his self-worth. That, that he derived relative value from the difference between him and other people. 
And this caused all sorts of problems. He started with work issues and then family problems as he imposed his psychological constructs on his wife and kids. And finally, he ended up at depression where he saw me. Previously, I was a psychiatrist. So uh, this is one of my cases in the past. Um, this is a, a, an just a story to set the scene for what an exclusive education uh, has done to one person. And I'll share with you about, you know, exclusive education is essentially any, any environment or any program that seeks to exclude people and create a customized group of people. So the, the most common forms of exclusive education are A, exclusion by ability or academics, B, exclusion by uh, wealth status, and C, the worst kind would be exclusion by, uh, say, uh, racial profile or social networking, that you have to be the who's who in order to get here. Those are the, the, the types of exclusive education we see. And there are three main problems I'm going to share with you about um, ex this exclusive education and what it causes. The first one is an externalized sense of self-worth. I'm going to go through it slowly, so don't worry. The second, impossibly high expectations of what they're supposed to do with their advantages. And the third, of course, is a value that's me measured relative to others. So the first one is an externalized sense of self-worth. Now, maybe you would have heard of this. It's called locus of control. And for... For a lot of people, they, they agree that an internal locus of control is really good. And that's when you start believing that I make things happen. I can control the situation. An external locus of control is where other people determine my situation. Um, and in many schools that practice exclusion, the, the child's drive to maintain their place in the exclusive school becomes increasingly externalized because they, they judge that value based on what other people say of them, whether they are worthy of being in that school, so on and so forth. And that means that the locus of control shifts from I control my destiny to they control my destiny. And it happens because of comparative words like, oh, you've got to do the, you got to do the really well at exams today because you need to maintain your grades to stay in this school. And these shift the reason for doing things, or put it in another way, your locus of control to an external one. Just for comparison, words like do the best you can, or I believe you can do it, drive the locus of control internally. The, the second one is um, impossibly high expectations of advantages. And generally, um, for a lot of children in exclusive positions, because of exclusive environments, um, they have an elevated status in society. So whether I'm uh, part of a rich man's uh, school or whether I'm in a school where only the who's who goes to it, or I'm in a school that uh, uh, has super high academics only and only high academic kids go to that school. And this subsequently results in an increased pressure to succeed. So, you know, statements like, wow, you're in that school. You must be very smart. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you do great things. Um, these sort of expectations get placed upon these kids and the pressure is incredibly high to meet the expectations of others in these situations. And finally, in many expensive schools, and this is particular where wealth or social networking is the measurement of exclusivity, children experience a unique type of pressure. For girls, the onus on being attractive is incredibly high. Research tells me that girls in exclusive schools were doubly affected by perceived duty. Not taking care of your appearance is just not acceptable for well-off or well-to-do young women. And for boys, they're a little bit different. They strive harder to be at the top. The alpha, the one whose status in society has been earned by possession of command of the room. And this puts boys at, at real risk of being less compassionate and kind. They can have a low capacity for tenderness in, in close relationships and a high capacity for chauvinism and narcissism. And in a recent study, it was found that narcissistic ex exhibitionism scores among affluent boys at elite private schools were double the average scores of a more diverse sample. Well, now, I'm, now that I've shared with you a little bit about what is exclusive, what, what is exclusion, the concept, and what exclusive schools can do to a child, I want to share with you about inclusion. Now, inclusion, a lot of people keep saying, oh, S-E-N, S-E-N. That's a very commonly misunderstood phrase because inclusion is not just special education needs. Inclusion is a mindset. It's about welcoming, developing, and advancing a diverse mix of individuals. It's about making people feel valued and making sure that everyone feels they have the same opportunity to advance and make an impact. 
You know, and this comes from Alan Taft the, from the Kellogg School of Management, somebody much smarter than I am. And if, if we believe that every child is special, then every child has special needs. And we need to treat them like the unique individuals that they are. Okay, so now I'm gonna share with you about the benefits of an inclusive education. There's three main benefits I can share with you. One is internalize a self-worth by creating a safe space. And the second one is individualized learning can start to happen. And finally, empathy. Now there's lots of things that inclusive education can do, but I'm gonna focus on these three big things as really important so that um, everybody can understand. And you can take these and, and practice inclusion in your own families as well. Um, by welcoming everybody into the conversation. So by, by recognizing each individual as unique with his or her own challenges, not that everybody is on the same sliding scale. Some people are better than another because they don't fit the standard scale. Then the focus becomes accepting people for what they are, not what we expect them to be. This creates a less judgmental environment and by default, a safe space where a child feels safe. Incidentally, psychological safety was the number one determinant of a great team, according to Google. And when a person feels safe, they're able to take risks around others, to explore more risky and socially risky endeavors, confident that no one will embarrass or punish anyone else for making a mistake, asking a question, or offering a new idea. Secondly, once you create that safe space, Every child learns differently. When they're in an environment where everyone welcomes their uniqueness, they can explore different ways of learning, like kinesthetic learning, or even some difficult memory techniques. If a child is constantly belittled every time he asks a question with a response like, if you don't know that you shouldn't be in this school or this class, I thought you were smarter than that. You know, the whole exclusion sort of concept, those high expectations driving in, they aren't, they aren't gonna want to reveal their weaknesses. They aren't gonna wanna try. In an inclusive classroom, students feel free to seek help, fall down, and get back up. Your child learns by constantly venturing outside his comfort zone to explore new things, to wonder. And he can only feel, he can only do that effectively if he feels safe to do so. And finally, developing empathy. It is so important this by shifting the focus from how you are better than other people to everyone is unique, accept them. Children are encouraged to invest time to understand others. It develops empathy and automatically enhances their relationship with others by seeking first to understand. The world is no longer a place where they, they seek to take advantage of situations by gaining the upper hand over others, but a place where everyone has their individual challenge. And once they empathize with others, they will naturally seek to help those around them. So I've shared with you about exclusivity and exclusion and what that does to your child. I've also shared with you about inclusion and what an inclusive mindset does to a child. Now, I'm going to pass the time over to Ms. Lee Sien. Uh, Ms. Leeson, who's going to share with us her, the perspective from a parent who's actually seen and felt all of this happen. Leeson, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. Hi, everyone. I'm Leeson. Um, my husband and me are parents to a pair of twins, a boy, a girl and a boy. Um, my girl is actually a child with Down syndrome. And the other, uh, my boy, is actually a neurotypical or a regular child. So they are also children of uh, mixed parentage because my husband is Malaysian Indian and I'm Malaysian Chinese. So perhaps we are in a pretty unique position to tell you um, more about diversity and inclusive education. So here's what we hope inclusive education will realize for each of our children. Um, firstly, we always wanted for them to be in the same school despite their learning um, differences and so, so that they can remain close, grow up together, learn the same things, learn in the same environment and of course for logistics and also economic reasons. For our special child, um, my daughter Isha, we wanted a school that would, able, able to, would be able to integrate her fully with all her regular peers in a mainstream classroom and in all classes, not in just selected classes, and also a school that would work with us to actually help us um, make adaptations to support our daughter in this mainstream system. So she could uh, learn uh, early on how to survive in the real world with regular people. 
And yet we also wanted a school that was robust enough and challenging enough uh, for her twin brother, our regular child, a school that not only focuses on academic achievements because uh, we wanted some a school that would build soft skills and also good character. And because of his special sibling, of course, we wanted a school that would also promote an inclusive mindset where he he could learn how to be compassionate and kind and have empathy and a, a deep appreciation for diversity. And here I want to say like what Dr. Vincent said, while we commonly think of inclusive education as special education needs, um, I really think it's more than that. You know, having uh, two children in different, uh, who are different in that way, I strongly believe that inclusive education actually benefits all children even the regular children, because not only, um, you know, the common things like you can learn about diversity, racial, cultural, and also neurodiversity. But I think also, if you go to an inclusive school, the tendency is for the, uh, for the teachers, for the staff, for the environment to be more sort of sensitive and empathetic to your child. You know, like, for example, when you're looking for a school, what parent here? you know, doesn't believe that their child is so unique, right? Everybody believes their child is su supremely unique and like a unique little snowflake. What parent here wants a child, a school that where teachers will take time to recognize all their strengths and weaknesses and also take time to discover how each child learns differently and to optimize that kind of learning differences. So, well, a pedagogy that is inclusive by design will, will benefit all children. And, you know, disability is something that, you know, you, your child may not have, but in, in, in time, all of us also will have challenging times. Look at the pandemic now. And, and a lot of times we get old. Also, sometimes we get ill. So we, will, we need to live in a society with a lot of caring individuals like you see around us now who are helping each other. So what, when you go, when your child learns in an inclusive environment, they are more likely to grow up to become um, caring members of society, I think. Thank you. Dr. Vincent, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like one of my Zoom classes, actually. Yeah, you're muted, you're muted. It's, oh, so sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to share with you about um, inclusion and how the IB programs do this. So we are, Fairview International School is a full IB school. So we do only the IB and I'm gonna really chow down on, you know, we know that inclusion is better than exclusion. I mean, you naturally teach your kids how they are better than other people. You're gonna end up having children brought up in really the wrong way. So that's, that's the easy situation to understand. And we've also shared about you know, how inclusion is just better than exclusion. Um, it, it creates a much better human being in my opinion a kinder human being that's not going to judge everybody. Um, so I'm going to show you how the IB intentionally develops inclusion. And there's four things that it's going to do. First of all, the I, right at the core of the IB programs is this concept called international mindedness. Now, in, in a lot of places, you can say, we're international schools. You're like, how do we do internationalism? Oh, we show them flags and fun fairs and foods and fashion and so on and so forth. That's not international mindedness at all. Just giving them some context about what happens in different countries is not international mindedness either. International mindedness is this, the belief that others with their differences can also be right. And I've drawn that definition right out of the IB mission statement. This concept is the polar opposite of traditional education that drills into each child that there's only one right answer in, in exam questions, or that if you're number one, uh, then nobody else can be number one. Or if you're number two, you must beat number one. So you have to fight with other people. Your, your value is measured against other people those children end up believing that there's only one right answer to each question. And they also believe that in order for me to succeed, you have to fail. Classic. IB children, on the other hand, are open-minded, ready to listen, and accept others as they are, not force others into ac accepting their own opinion. They become wonderful leaders because they, ac they accept people for what they are, not who we expect them to be. 
in an IB education, you're going to see lots of touch points of international mindedness. The teachers will purposely throw ethical questions at kids on how can we accept people for what they are during the lessons, not in a separate class, during the lessons. The second reason why, how the IB does it is creating this environment of safety. Uh, and I'll share with you a little bit about how that works. So the... Um, Inquiry-based teaching and learning is one of the most poorly understood teaching methods. It's also what we use. It's also one of the most powerful teaching methods when used correctly. Most teachers believe that it's about asking a lot of questions to their students. Like, what's the answer to this? What's the answer to this? What's this? By the way, that's called interrogation, not inquiry. Inquiry is the process of drawing out curiosity, asking what could it be instead of what's the right answer to my question? Children become excited to learn, happy in the process of learning, not panicky and terrified whenever the teacher comes into the room. It's about welcoming possibilities, not pigeonholing children into one right answer. You know, you ask a question and then a child offers one potential answer. You say, that could be right in that situation. Why do you think that's right? You know, instead of, no, that's the wrong answer. You need, this is the right answer. That, that's, that's traditional education. That's terrible. It's about discovery of knowledge and interest, not being told what to like and learn. Inquiry-based teaching and learning creates an environment for children to feel safe, to explore. And it sends the message that invites students to go beyond their boundaries. It creates a right environment to nurture inclusiveness. The next thing that we do in classes, which is really important, is differentiation. And it's the process of edu educating the child where they are, not where we expect them to be. To help the child learn in a way that's appropriate for them, taking into account their uniqueness. Teachers pay a lot of attention to their learning styles, ability levels, language levels, and interests when constructing the educational experience. And as a result, the learning experience and assessments are personalized to a large degree. It can't, it, uh, I don't think in, in, even in our education, we can personalize to every single child one by one, but to a very large degree, it's personalized already. And not just on one scale of, you know, just academic scores or how well they can memorize facts for a test, but on many scales, language, academic ability, and even skills of presentation, perhaps. Where a traditional classroom only has one kind of assessment, the paper and pen exam, the IB classroom has presentations, and even creating videos to convince a prime minister to adopt solar power. And finally, character development is crucial in inclusive school, inclusive environments. You need to develop this properly. And it's intentionally done, not accidentally done in IB schools. I've never seen, never, any other educational system that so systematically develops character like the IB. Character development is first based around the learner profile. 10 values that we want to nurture, like being caring and principled and open-minded. So every single child the class experiences has value-based activities built into it. So children don't learn about being good in a separate classroom, just like the way morals, are, morals classes are done, but integrated right into where they are currently learning. For example, when they learn about electricity, the light bulb, and maybe Edison, we introduce a conversation about how Edison actually bought the patent to the light bulb not invented it, and we discuss if it's right for Edison to take all the credit for its invention, even when he didn't invent it, focusing on the, the value of being principled. And in biology, we consider how the world's food crisis could be solved with solutions like going vegan or eating insects and role play with the kids. How do you persuade another person how to take one of these alternative diets, focusing on being open-minded? Character development can be implemented in a separate class to learn explicitly, but it must also be tightly integrated with all aspects of the learning experience to internalize that learning implicitly. That's where everybody misses out. Um, and finally, I'd like to leave you with this beautiful statement uh, by Elaine Hall. Inclusion elevates all. Exclusion seeks to elevate one at the expense of others. Uh, and diversity is having a seat at the table. So you're gonna have a lot of schools tell you, oh, we got a lot of kids from many places. Diversity is only the first part, having a seat at this table. Inclusion is having a voice 
right? And belonging is having that voice heard. In IB schools, we go all the way down to belonging. All right. So, Ms. Lee San, over to you to share with us about your personal experience with the IB and inclusion. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. Um, okay, I just uh, I thought I'd just share with you my children's journey so you can see what they do in school and how what have what has happened in the last three years. This is my twins' first day of school. It was three years ago, and um, what they were like when they first started, they were five years old. They started at the Fairview International School in Subang Jaya. Prior to this, we had actually visited 14 schools personally, looking for a suitable school for both my kids, you know, a school that practice inclusive education, and also there is one that is affordable. This is a very difficult to find um, in our country. And um, because inclusive education in our country is not practiced in, in its entirety. We are in, so we were very encouraged to find a school that, you know, upon initial is assessment of my daughter's ability and situation, we're willing to try her out and to work closely with us to support um, their learning needs, um, both their learning needs. So whilst the school didn't explicitly promote itself um, as an inclusive school, but actually in time we learned that it is inclusive, the approach, the pedagogy is inclusive by design. So my twins had already been attending a private uh, mainstream play school that was inclusive, where my daughter with Down syndrome had successfully been integrated with regular children, and I could already see the big benefits, and so I was keen for her to continue in that way. And before that, she was also in a special school since the age of two months in the Kiwanis Down Syndrome Foundation Center. Um, as I mentioned, my son is a regular child, although uh, you always say neurotypical, but what is really neurotypical, you know, what is typical? Every child, like what Dr. Vincent says, has special needs. No child is really that typical. They all have their quirks, their unique personality traits. And my son is also like that. He's, he was very sensitive when he first started school very shy around people he didn't know well and cognitively and physically he could do most things that a child his age could do and his sister was about six months to a year behind him um, and you know he cried every day in fact he adjusted um, she adjusted better to school he cried every day for the first three months in, in, in class um, she started off in reception and he was in grade one so she you know had a lot of frustration in the beginning she couldn't do many things she couldn't read she couldn't write she was fairly verbal she knew some simple concepts um, but it was very I think she was very frustrated so sometimes she would avoid uh, tasks by lying on the floor, hiding in the playroom. And actually, I was quite worried because we didn't know much about IB then. And we were very worried about how an in sort of inquiry-based system would, would, um, would be relevant for her, you know, a child like her. Okay, but let me go to the next slide and show you where they are now and a little bit of the in-between. So this is last month, my children's birthday. They are eight now and their birthday on the 26th of June. And um, they just finished their third year of IB education in Fairview. And we saw so, we have seen so many positive changes in them. Um, so for example, uh, my daughter, she can now read on her own. In the last year, she learned how to read. She can write, she can take notes in the class, in the online class, understand most of the concepts taught uh, after some simple adaptation and simplification is done. She's not afraid to do presentations. Um, she can perform in the front of a class and a school, and it's always game to try new things. And she has surprised us with her understanding of the world. She asks some quite relevant questions that are very surprising to us. She can even play the violin a little bit with some help. And she's very tenacious. You know, she always keeps trying and she's quite self-driven. She, she usually seeks out to do her own homework. And even though I know she has exceeded a lot of our expectations, and I know she will continue to face many challenges as a child uh, with Down syndrome and an adult later on, but I feel more confident today that she will be able to overcome them. My son also has a lot of tremendous growth. He will tell you enthusiastically that he loves school. He likes maths, uh, English and art. He's curious about how things work. He has, a, for a child, he is quite principled and he has a very strong sense of justice and compassion that I notice for people, animals, and but of course he still fights with his sister. And he's not afraid to make mistakes compared to when he first started. 
And even though he's still, you can see from the presentation videos later, he's still a bit shy and he's, he shies away from the spotlight, but he is definitely a lot more comfortable today with doing the presentations and offering his opinions when asked. So my husband and I really credit a lot of these positive developments um, uh, to the IB education and to the school. And now let me just show you um, what my children have done so you can actually see. So these are the benefits, I think. I won't go into them into detail, but you can see some of the little details I've included there. Um, there are six things we really feel that the IB education, and some of them uh, Dr. Vincent has mentioned, you know, it develops the whole child. It has the learner profiles. They only con not only concentrate on the academic side of things, but also on the character side of things. So the child ends up with very strong social, emotional uh, and emotional traits aside from the academic um, strength. And it's inclusive by design and nature. There's a lot of differentiation. And I've, and also the grades, they are banded. You know, the age groups are banded. Like in grade one, it's a banded um, age group. It's not a fixed age. And I think also every child, even if they're strong in academic thing, there are always things that they can work on. So the, the, the system actually provides for that. You know, like Dr. Vincent said, so, and then the videos you saw earlier about the coaching that they've been doing in, in the schools. And, and it connects the dots. So it, it sort of has a transdisciplinary approach where actually the subject is not taught in isolation. And I'll show you how later. They teach the similar themes across the different subjects. There's inquiry-based learning, you know, across all the age groups, uh, even very young children. You know, I remember when they first started um, school, my son actually interviewed uh, his grandparents on, on a series of questions and then they collected the data and then they compiled it in the class. So it's the kind of thing that you would do maybe as an adult or even a college student, right? And core skills, they focus a lot of core skills over content. You know, in our era today, course content, it just um, changes so fast. It's not relevant like today and then tomorrow it's, it's, it's outdated already. So core skills are very important and they do it through developing approaches to learning skills like research, self-management, social skills, communication skills and thinking skills. And of course, the very important thing of raising a global citizen who is also multilingual because there's also um, multilingualism promoted in the school through language learning and um, encourages students to always consider local and global context. So learning is very meaningful and insightful because everything you learn in class is related to real world situation, real world problems. Okay, next. So I'm going to show you some of his work. You know, as you go through the work, I want you to think about three things. How um, the same kind of thing, uh, learning the skills and also the content is applied differently with my two children with very different needs and also applied with uh, older, a child in the older grade and a younger grade. And also um, the fact that, you know, um, they is also all the skills they do are very relevant to each of my children even though they are very different. So this is what my son's project was um, last year, end of last year, he did um, this thing. What they have is we call unit of inquiries, you know, in the transdisciplinary, there's a unit of inquiry where there's a theme. So he did a unit of inquiry um, relating to inventions and innovations. And he likes cars very much. So he wanted to do something on the car as an invention. So the first on the left side, you can see he actually did a little poster on what a car was like, what the invention of the car. And then the teacher asked him to think about how can he improve on the existing innovation of the car. So he, he drew a, a, a thing and then he sort of like wrote down some improvements. Then after that, in the larger end of semester project, he actually had to use his research skills to propose a brand new uh, innovation on the car. So he thought about how, you know, he was always stuck in traffic jams, going to visit his grandparents in Johor. And then he thought, okay, I really want to do a flying car. And he had to use his data, build a model, write a news article to launch the car, and then also record a video launching the car. And recently, you know, there have been a lot of uh, prototypes of uh, flying cars now. There was one recent one where the car flew from two international airports in Slovakia. So he was very excited because he could see that his project has come to life. You know, maybe it will happen in his lifetime. So if you have a look at the next uh, video, just we'll just play a little bit how he presented. And this is my child who really doesn't like presentation before. The Petronas Twin Towers. 
It's Malaysia's first flying car called the Sky Car. Here's the logo. Our tagline is, you never will be caught in traffic again. The name Sky Car is also from my name Akash, that means sky in old Sanskrit language. <laughs> I was inspired to build this car because I will always get stuck in traffic jams when traveling to Johor to visit my grandparents, going to school in Subang Jaya, and moving around the city. The car design. He's very nervous. Inspired <laughs> by the car DeLorean from the movie Back to the Future. Okay. And this is uh, another project um, that he did um, last year, also uh, in November, where he actually had to um, do, uh, he was studying about habitats and animal adaptations, where he had to re research a chosen habitat, in which he chose the polar region and the animals. And during art class, he created a diorama using um, a box, and then he put some animals there. Then in maths, they actually um, did uh, what they call fraction, they were doing fractions, so the teacher taught them to how to do heavy fractions. So based on the animals that he placed in the diorama, like two deer, three wolves, and things like that, he had to create a kind of fraction um, poster. They call it heavy fractions, and then he related maths. So maths came in as uh, data to support his diorama. And then also, um, he had to do a poster and a presentation about uh, animal adaptation. How do all these polar animals adapt to the environment? And issues related, he had to think about issues relating to human activities and also the habitat, the impact on the environment and propose some solutions. And of course, video in a presentation. And this last poster here, um, you can see here and where we are in place and time was his very latest one before he finished grade three in June. Um, this chart we did together, we sat down and did together about all the things he learned in the second semester uh, to present in his celebration of learning video. Um, and you, the unit of inquiry was actually, um, the theme was where we are in place and time. And he, in this unit of inquiry, he learned about structures. So in, in structures in social science and science, he learned about famous structures around the world, natural and man-made structures, what are structures, um, how are structures built, what are the materials used to build structures, and then their properties, why are they used in different ways, and even magnets, how are magnets found in everyday appliances and things around the house. And in his end of unit uh, assessment project, he had to build a house. So you can see that on the uh, right-hand side, he actually designed a house and he chose to use a 3D design software um, and he did it all himself. I didn't help him at all. He kind of figured it out with some the teacher's guidance. And then in maths, he was doing a lot of uh, 3D and 2D shapes, which are relating to structures. They also learn about uh, area perimeter, which relates to space and also how to read a Cartesian map. Um, how to read Cartesian point on a Cartesian plane, like in the mapping exercise. And for English, he wrote about a structure that he liked, um, like the he chose the Lord Murugan statue in, um, in the Batu Keys. And he also learned about myths and legends and all the settings and the structures related to like the Greek structures, you know. And in Mandarin and BM, they learn a lot of related words. They are related to materials and structures. And even in uh, for art, they did a lot of things related to uh, famous artists and their techniques. But a lot of it was related to also structures you find around your house and also um, places. So I think it's this is what we mean by the transdisciplinary approach. It kind of cuts through all the different disciplines and shows you like how a theme can be related. Before I show you uh, this next video, I just want to give you a bit of pre prelude. Um, my daughter has Down syndrome, as I mentioned, and I want, she learned to read over the past year. And, you know, I would say that she was a weak reader. And when she was, because she was a weak re reader, even videoing is hard because she cannot read scripts. And um, one of my friends actually recently told me about his child's kindergarten, where the teacher would call up the children and the parents and reprimand them for not being able to read and write and these are kindergarten children you know I, I felt so sorry when I heard that but you know in my daughter's online class the teacher 
has always, I always, uh, she knows that she's a weak reader. She always encourages her to read on the screen, the online text, and no children in the class, actually nobody will laugh at her. Everybody will always wait patiently for her to finish, even though sometimes she's a bit slow and some words she needs help. And because of that, and of course, through some other working at home and in school, she's learned to read. And now she's quite a quite confident reader and willing to try uh, pronouncing new words she's never read before. And this next video is showing you, you know, um, she's actually, she did it for a project for the Malaysian chapter of a global organization called Best Buddies, which tries to pair regular children with um, children with special needs. So you have a look, you know, uh, I'm amazed at her, her, even her speech development now. Hey there, my friend. We haven't met yet, but I'm very excited to get to know you. I'm sure we have a lot in common and we are above completely special in too many ways. Just like you, I enjoy playing outside and feeling the wind on my face as I run around. Just like you, I like picking up sand and shells and hugging. She was practicing for her presentation and this is, um, she was asked to find a product that she likes and she, she had to research my, and she had to talk about it. And this is my UOS presentation. All my product, my product has, um, is Magnum? Magnum ice cream. Okay. <laughs> she eats a lot of Magnum ice cream. Ice cream is a good, it is also yeah. a want. Asking is a here? food product. Here. Yeah, food product. the food product like let you have a plague. And <laughs> yeah, for example, okay. frog is full of knife. Okay, then sec like number three. Point to here, number three. Number three. Okay, now oh. read number three, third page. Okay. Turn. Okay. Magnum ice cream has five mint. Five flavors. Five. Main flavor. Yeah. Main. Yeah, you can just pause. I will talk around it. Collect yeah. So it. she had to uh talk about the you know the product, where it's from, who manufactures it, what are the flavors, why does it benefit uh people to have Magnum ice cream in Malaysia, even though it's not from Malaysia. So you know it's quite interesting, even at that grade two level, they're already thinking about you know how the world works. So the next slide you can see um this was in December 2020 when her reading really started improving and this piece um I'll show you the art piece later they they show how they combine in the transdisciplinary yeah. way English maths and art she went to the garden she so. saw some birds in the trees they were very noisy she saw thought maybe they are hungry. I can feed them some worms. There are three trees in my garden. Every tree has two birds in. So in the next slide, you can see the actual uh, drawing she did. It combines art, English and maths because she had to write a story about the walk in the garden and then she had to talk about how each tree has three three trees have two birds each and then she had to do the maths equation she had to show it in like a math story so it combines so this one is also um, her progress in her handwriting this was actually one year ago the first uh, piece is one year ago this was how she used to take notes it's very incoherent I didn't understand what she was talking about I can can see that something about happy birthday and and then after that uh, in the middle of the year, in January uh, school year, she did the second one. But it was online school and I had to guide her. I had to tell her where to write the simple sentences. And this is in June. The third one is in June. She copied the notes um, on her own. Everything is on her own. I only help her with the arrows. So she, because she had been doggedly doing it every day and the teacher encouraged her, she now can take her own notes and I can actually understand them, you know. I know exactly what she has written. Um, so this is how she has developed. And just the last uh, few videos on um, 
this is my they do uh they are also learning in orchestra instruments in school be, as part of the core curriculum and this is my son he was playing it for a recent school music assessment <laughs> In the beginning, he couldn't play at all, and he this you no. Know, now we sort of help him and we get him to do accompaniments. So he has learned how to be quite goal oriented, and he perseveres. And he you know in despite a lot of initial failure in trying to do the recording, he continues. So the instrument itself, of course, learning the instrument is good in its own for entertainment value. And, and educational value, but also the skills that he learns surrounding the learning of the instrument. And then my daughter, okay, you say, oh, how can a child with Down syndrome, she has poor motor skill uh, control. How can she learn right. an instrument that's like I'm the violin? And today I'm going to play and to drink a little star on my pan and No. Yeah, in the beginning, I always have to help her press down the fingering in the right places. That's how she learned the teacher work with me. And we did it by chunking, what he called chunking. He said, okay, for her, she may learn differently. So we, we chunk it. We do one bar, then two bars, then three bars. I used to help her press down. Slowly, I let her try to press it on her own. And now she can play a few bars on her own. And hopefully by the end of this year, she can play the whole song on her own. So, you know, it's a kind of diff I just wanted to show these videos to show you there's a different, how they differentiate it and how they can help to adapt and, and sort of support the child at a different learning stage. Um, okay, so of course, the next slide, of course, the best gains from an IB education can be obtained if your child is in a full IB school, particularly from a young age. However, I think IB principles are very universal they are very uh, inclusive by design and they can be applied at home in daily life. And here are some points I always keep in mind for myself, for both my children, that you might like to consider also applying for your own. Uh, for example, we focus on their strengths, but help them overcome their weaknesses. My child, like my son, is good. Academically, he's okay, but you know he needs a lot to work on other things, the softer skills. So the whole child, the growth mindset, number two. Um, we also, you know... Um, we talk about keep learning, you know, and uh, instead of just keeping up, we are not keeping up with others because we are not test, there's no big testing in the school. We just do assessments. So the emphasis is on my children to keep learning, especially for my special child. And your child now, compared to a, your child a year ago, you compare. And if that comparison show you that they have progressed, that's good, you know, instead of just trying to keep up with others and, you know, like what Dr. Vincent said, the external local, and you raise a, a driven collaborator. You're not. You're not raising competitors that make that have to win at the expense of others. Number three, um, the third point. You develop all the senses because the IB school, you know, he, he focuses on learning through different ways. So not only visual learning and written expression. You learn through listening, hearing. You know, doing kinesthetic learning. And number four, um, also a lot of art. They use a lot of art. And I want to show you these pictures here because art is not just a, art as a subject. Art is used as a tool for transdisciplinary learning. For example, that colorful picture you see there is actually my son's drawing, his interpretation of uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. You know, he went through the story of Four Seasons. He drew it in a piece. He was asked to interpret it in a piece. And then for maths, he learned about angles in the name, in the letters of their name. And then um, this piece here with the black lines in the middle is my daughter. She drew about what happened, the impact of uh, human activities in settlements. She had to draw a picture on that. And of course, art as a subject, my son was learning about pointillism and he produced this using markers, the last piece. And also we encourage children to try new and novel experiences. They take risks, they build confidence, preservation, pre perseverance, and also resilience, you know, through things like learning an instrument and you know, trying to get something right in the presentation. And the next slide, um, also um, the emphasis is more on learning by understanding instead of learning by rote. Even, even my special child, I do not uh, make her learn by rote. I do not make her memorize things without understanding. We just adapt, we simplify, but we never dumb down. 
and we find a theme that we can find different ways to learn the theme. So there's more sticky points in the brain. Uh, my, my daughter's therapist always says she can learn, but you, can, you have to create more sticky points in the brain. So joining the dots is a fantastic way for her to improve her memory on a certain thing. And we relate what kids learn to the real world and real world problems, encouraging curiosity and questioning the norm. In, like when they go for walks on the park, they always ask very interesting questions to us. Um, like my son will say, why do these two birds make different sounds? Can they understand each other? Can birds fly to the clouds? Is it because it, do they, they won't have oxygen? Can I build a helmet with oxygen for the bird to fly to space, to learn about space? You know, my son will ask a lot of these questions. And my daughter, she may not ask very sophisticated questions, um, but she asks, still asks a lot of why. She may, link, uh, she may look around her and and repeat the Chinese words, the BM words, the English words to things. She also learns a lot of concepts in school, like life cycle of a butterfly, a frog. She will link them to things she sees outside. So I hope I have um, an emphasis of the mastery of core skills, of course, as we mentioned before, because core skill is useful, especially in college and even for special kids. You know, it's, it's something that all kids need and global citizens. Um, so I hope I've given you a fairly good idea of how ed IB education works for uh, your little ones and how it has really benefited my kids and how it's been able to offer good differentiation and related support for their very, very different learning needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vincent and Ms. Lishan. It is indeed a very meaningful webinar. We have a better picture now on how we could apply the IB concepts at home and in school to fully develop our children, grow and become a lifelong learner. Now, our speakers are open to answering questions from our participants. Dear participants, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box or unmute yourself to ask your questions directly. Surely, I think uh, the, maybe we can go through a couple of the questions already put over there. Like, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, Lisian's um, opinion on some of them. So, Lisian, we'll, the, there is a question particularly uh, about uh, from uh, El Yanti. Um, how is the school adapting uh, to the online environment to continue to make learning inclusive? Um, I think, like what I said, um, usually the teacher um, takes takes up great effort to always include my child in the conversation. Like they 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 sort of they don't single out anybody. They treat her just like everyone else. And I think when there's an opportunity for her to work on something that she's weak at, like reading, then they will call on her to read. And everybody, um, they will encourage everybody to encourage her also. So I think that's and also um. Certain I think the way the online school has been structured has been very good. Um, even though the students are now all online, there is no, uh, the transition is very smooth. They're still learning in a very robust way. Um, and after school, they usually have some hotlines. So for children, I think that's a very good way. We, we structure our, the way that the school has done it is they structure in short periods, like 40 minutes, they give them a break, 40 minutes, then there's a morning break and then there's a, uh, 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 what called brain food break later on in the late uh, towards noon and then after that they if students still cannot cope and the teacher knows that certain students are lagging behind or maybe they are not getting enough support because now online school a lot of parents are working also they need some support um, they usually ask them to call in during the hotline so my daughter has used this hotline a couple of times to help her so that I don't have to sit there with her. The teacher is sitting there with her, supervising her like one-on-one -on -one or two kids, three kids, just a few of them. They're doing the homework together. So I think um, that's there was also another child that was in my son's class that was on the spectrum. She was also using this hotline a lot. And not just special needs kids, there's a lot of regular kids need support too, you know. And, and as a parent community, I think we are also supportive of each other. We try to help each other to uh, catch up with, you know, we catch up with each other on what our children are doing. So I think that also helps a lot. Mm. Um, I'll just expand on that a little bit, what we do during the online classes. So one, the learning has not stopped. So in our school, what we have found through the data is that children are not losing out because they're learning online. Uh, our grades overall are actually better than ever. Maybe it's because the kids have no choice but to stay at home and work. 
uh, <laughs> that they, they have to learn. But grades wise, the kids are not going, uh, are not losing out academically year on year. We're actually doing better. Uh, the last two years saw our highest ever um, IB diploma scores. Uh, and across the board, I can tell you from the data because I see it. Uh, all the kids are doing really well, actually, uh, whether it's us focusing better or doing better. Um, the other thing is that the, this hotline and tutorials is a really interesting thing that uh, Lisa has touched on. So an, a class is typically one hour and 20 minutes. So we, the teacher does stuff for one hour and then we leave the last 20 minutes of each class to what we call tutorials. So we use two words, tutorials and hotlines, okay? So the last 20 minutes becomes the tutorial where let's say Ms. Hardas was my teacher and she's taught for one hour. And the last minute she said, Vincent, you and Johnny, two of you stay back because I can look <laughs> at your eyes just now and uh, both of you look like you didn't know what I was talking about. So you stay back yeah. and I'm going to check on you now. So during the last 20 minutes, there's that opportunity for students to catch up immediately and not yeah. fall off the wagon too long. And then if you want to drag it a little bit further to the end of the day, if the kids go back and they're reading the notes, they're like, I really don't get this. Then they simply, the hotline, like the links are up there. So they're like all these virtual classrooms. They just jump onto the link because the teacher's sitting there waiting for them from 2 to 3.30 to just jump on and say, hi, teacher, uh, can I ask you something about this, 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 this? And the teacher's just sitting there waiting for them to come in and ask any question they want. So that that personalized sort of effect that we've created using the hotlines and the tutorials has really, really made a difference. Um, and I think it's, it's both good online practice and good face-to-face -face practice. And it's very likely that this is a practice we'll bring across into our physical uh, classes once we go back as well, because it is a really powerful technique uh, of making sure all the kids, no kid is left behind essentially. Uh, so thank you very much for elaborating on that, Lisian. No problem. Thank you, Dr. Vincent and Ms. Lishan. We have another question here from Ms. Arya. Why would you recommend the IB syllabus over IGCSE and is it more inclusive? Oh, okay. So uh, I posted like this. Uh, surely you helped me post this giant 10 point thing. Over there. <laughs> so I was like, okay, if you really want me to answer that, I'll put all of it down. Um, I'm a parent and I put all of my 10 points over there. Uh, why I, I like it. So one of the things that most people don't won't know, I'll explain that one. I won't bother with the rest. Most traditional education systems, when they come and check on the school to see whether they're doing well, they check on the what of learning. Are you using the right syllabus? Do you have enough teachers? Uh, do you put in the right amount of time? And are your exams correct? These are, this is what typically happens when they check a school. With the IB, they're less concerned about that because you better have that covered. That's like the given. If you can't do that, don't be a school at all. That's silly. But what the IB does, it says, how are you teaching? Let me see your lesson plans. Did you use the right technique? Do your students like you and do your parents think that you're doing a good job? So they actually go into the how of teaching very intensely. They scrutinize everything. These guys are pit bulls when it comes to the evaluation. And they, you know, they really go into each teacher and say, how are you doing it? Are you doing it well? Are you teaching properly? So they focus on, are we teaching and learning properly? Rather than what are we teaching and learning? Because frankly, the what, the facts are not that important in today's world when we have Google and there's just so much in the way of facts. Anyone can memorize facts, but it's the how of teaching, the method of teaching that's really important, creating safe spaces, drawing out curiosity, focusing on understanding rather than memorizing. Those things are really important. And that's one of the things I love about the IB, uh, that traditional education will never ever catch up with because, well, they don't have it built into the system, frankly enough. It's just not there. So it, no matter which traditional education system you have, some schools in traditional education, like they do CIE, they will try and do a good job and teach well. But the question is, what standard are you teaching well to? Because I don't know what standard you're doing it to. I know for a fact that every IB school out there has this standard. And this standard is very high. It is furiously high. So I know as a parent that the standard of teaching and learning is of this standard because the IB comes and checks every IB school to know whether the teachers are teaching properly or not. Um, and that's what traditional schools cannot do because they don't check like that. They don't have those kind of standards by comparison. 
Um, yeah, so there's this other questions. Uh, puberty, an interesting question by LN. Uh, how does Fairview support the children as they go through puberty? This is a simple one. Uh, we do sex ed conversations and then con um, puberty conversations, consent conversations with the kids. It's part of the pastoral program. Not, not necessarily IB specific, frankly, but this is uh, what we do in Fairview. We're, we're well ahead on that one. Great. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. Okay, we also have another question from Mr. Saroff. Does Fairview offer SPM or purely IB? I'm considering SPM for future scholarships provided by the government, which recognize only SPM. At the same time, I'd like my daughter to be taught in an environment, vision, and objectives, such as Fairview. Hmm. Um, I think that uh, you need to check the specifics of the scholarships. And I do believe that the, go the government scholarships, or I'll just say local scholarships, yeah, not necessarily government. There are a lot of local scholarships that recognize the IB qualifications. Why do I tell you that? There is the, <clears throat> the largest IB diploma group in Malaysia is in Seremban in Marabanting where they have about 250 of the Malaysian scholars sponsored mm. to go there. They don't know how to recognize their own scholars. I don't know how to help already. <laughs> so definitely, I know that they recognize it. Uh, just look, on, look for it on the scholarship for, form uh, and ask them, look, do you recognize the IB? I'm pretty sure that they will because you know, even the government has its own scholarship program down in Mara. With, and 250 is a very large number, by the way. They're one of the biggest IB cohorts in the world uh, at that size. They're very big. Uh, so that's the scholarship question. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. Uh, there are another question from Ms. Ilianti. It's the question number two and number three. Would you like to elaborate it more, Mr. Vincent? I think, uh, Lisian, what did you send your daughter in at reception? Yes, uh, she started at reception. Um, I'm not sure how it's like. Of course, reception also is uh, it's also done in the IB way. Um, I remember when my daughter was in reception, she focused a lot on uh, core skills also, like phonics. She did a lot of phonics, jolly phonics when she first joined. And she also still uh, learned about uh, things about the world, but at an uh, age-appropriate way. I, I, I don't remember exactly, but she was still doing things that were age appropriate but yet still applying the IB principle so I would say that's how it's different because I think in other uh, maybe in other traditional system they usually unless it's more Montessori uh, you know usually a traditional school I think will focus on uh, very didactic teaching they will teach the child like this is like this and then you learn and then you it's very one-way sort of thing but but even when she was in reception, I remember the teacher used to ask questions and then she would, you know, and then they would uh, sing songs. They were still learning Mandarin and things relating to like, you know, their body, things that are immediately relatable to a small child uh, that, that is not so sophisticated yet or complex, but things in their own surrounding, my family, my body, you know, my body parts, and then it will still be linked in the cross-disciplinary and maths is of course very limited. It's just numbers, right? Um, so that's how they would do uh, reception. And then the shy, quiet one, I think, yeah, but like I said, in, the, in an IB school, I guess because of the differentiated learning approach, the teacher is by default have to be more sensitive to the, the strength and weakness of each child. So they will pay more attention um, instead of trying to standardize all children they, they they take time to sort of like bring the bring each child with the different strengths back into the conversation and and try to sort of mitigate like in my daughter's class you know there are children who are very expressive very they like to talk a lot but sometimes they're weak we follow through on work writing you know they don't have the stamina to do the writing then they, the teacher works on that or like my daughter she she likes to doggedly take notes, but then sometimes she's not good with the expressing part. Then, you know, we work on that. So it's a kind of, the teacher will be able to identify. And because of the report, the assessment reports are very detailed with the rubrics. We know exactly like what are the things she needs to work on. Even personality-wise, like my son, you know, he's not good at working with other people at this moment. So that is something where it's an ongoing work in progress for him. He, he's good at 
giving his opinion now, but he's not good at collaborating and negotiating with other people to help other people see why he thinks is this and then the other person, he, he just he tries to bulldoze his own opinion through. So he's working on it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, you know, the, the common perception is that in, in inquiry-based classes, because it's very discussional, you know, if you don't talk, the, the perception is the extroverts get a lot more out of the environment than the introverts. Um, first of all, extrovert, introvert, I think every child has a bit of both. Um, and what I tend to find is the label isn't helpful um, because the moment you start labeling somebody as an introvert, they start to change themselves to accompany that label. So yeah. first thing is I'd recommend don't use those labels on kids. They, there's so much they're going to develop into. Better not start on that one. Some children are naturally more quiet mm -hmm. and some people, children are naturally more loud. Um, that's also possible. But what I tend to find really in practice is Every child has a story to tell. The only question is, do they want to tell you the story? And if you don't know how to make that child feel safe and you don't know how to get them excited, they're not going to tell you the story. And I think that last principle is way more important than the labels of extrovert and introvert. If you can get a child to trust you and get them excited about their story and value their story when they share it, the next time they want you ask about their story, they'll share it with you. Uh, and that's really the whole of it, really, uh, with, when it comes to kids and talking. I, I don't like the introvert, extrovert label that uh, a lot of popular, popular psychology has been throwing around a lot. Uh, I don't think it's helpful. Actually, yeah. There's the other question about uh, basketball. Um, okay, so the IB itself doesn't focus on sports. It doesn't mm. become a sports-oriented curriculum. It's, it's not it. The IB believes in well-roundedness. So the kids do learn sports, but in the IB, we don't learn, um, I don't know about you, but when I was in school, PE was just like, here's a basketball, <laughs> go play. And it was really terrible. <laughs> like, just go play. Here's a football. Half of you go play football, half of you play basketball, girls go play volleyball or something like that. And it was the classic stuff we did in the IB. They teach you about, okay, let's go to the basketball. Uh, uh, this, this round, we're going to learn about basketball. And we're going to learn four things. About dribbling, we're going to learn about shooting. We're going to learn. So they go into the technicals and the specifics of basketball, not just yeah. go play. Um, you'll find that all of our PE lessons are, are really like that. Now, that does mean that the kids don't sweat quite as much like in the previous days, because in previous days, you just jump out there and sweat like crazy. So after that, in CCA, they have that opportunity to join the basketball club, or if they're really good, join the basketball team which our school actually sponsors a lot of the team for their, you know, competitions and stuff like that. I mean, pandemic, yeah, sure, it's not going to happen. But when school starts again, they'll get that opportunity. Uh, we've got a basketball team, uh, football team, swimming team, badminton team. Uh, different schools have different ones. I think Lisa on your side only has the basketball. Basketball, and yeah, because we don't have a pool and everything. But, yeah. but I think they still keep active in the PE. Like you said, they learn the technical aspect of the physical sports. But I think also we have uh, the outward, outward bound school thing, right, for the older kids. Yeah, in Port Dixon, maybe. Been, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to that. I haven't, my son hasn't come to that yet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I can share a bit about that one. Item number, so I share item number seven. So we, once a year, we send our kids for three days to our own Outward Bound School. Um, it's like a nature kind of thing where it's in Port Dixon, right beside the beach. The kids go over there. They put up tents. They sleep on the grass. They, they cook with the fire. They go jungle trekking. They, they navigate with a compass. It's crazy. Um, so there's a lot of like outdoor stuff along with leadership building. And all of that is really well uh, coordinated and choreographed. And then... On top of that, twice a year, they go internationally, not now, of course, but they go internationally, and then they take whatever they're learning in the classroom into the field. So, for example, uh, the kids went to Cambodia to go and visit the killing fields, and the concept that they were learning in the classroom was called genocide. Right? So they went to Cambodia, and they really dug into the concept of genocide and fascism and so on and so forth. Um, and so they took their learning outside the classroom, where so many... So many schools, they do like international expeditions. They don't link it to the classroom learning. It's just something that you can go with your kids, like as a parent, to go and visit, look and see this Buddha and look and see this statue. Um, but for us, we connect everything to learning that's happening in the classroom, not six months ago, right now, so that the kids don't have a disconnect between 
the expedition and the learning experience that it's really taken out into the field. And then they do the assessments on the floor, in the field, in, in, the, in the Angkor Wat or wherever it is that they are, they'll sit there on the floor and do their assessments right there, staring at the, the, the monuments or whatever it is. Because that's the way that you, you really build that feeling, that immersion right into them. Yeah. Okay, got, uh, okay, we've got two more questions coming through. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincent and Ms. Lishan. I think we mostly covered the question in our chat box. We're going to address a few remaining questions later. Okay, Our dear participants, if you have further questions, please feel free to type your question in the chat box and we will address them later. While waiting for the question to come in, allow me to run through some information about the organizer for today's talk. Fairview International School is the top IB school in Malaysia. The school has won multiple awards, including the International Award in Teaching and Learning the five stars quality assurance title by the, by the Malaysian government, as well as being one of the member of the Council of International School, which is what we so-called CIS. Fairview's success include smooth career transition, high academic success and great communication. Our high academic achievement is obvious by just looking through our latest IBDP results. Besides, the extremely high average score was also have 100% passing score for seven years. At Fairview, we believe our success is a result of our uniqueness through IB pedagogies. Our prosper at Fairview International School series of events and the Everyone's a Musician program. Feel free to contact us via WhatsApp and email using the details stated here. You may also browse our website, Facebook, and we have a lot of YouTube parenting tips. For more updates, please like our Facebook page and visit our website at www.fairview.edu.my. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and we would love you to be part of our Fairview International School community. For those who has questions, please stay and our speakers will continue to answer your questions. For those who need to leave, have a lovely weekend, stay home and stay safe. Hey, Ms. Dr. Vincent and Ms. Lisha, we have another set of questions. Okay. Thus, our question is from Ms. Cindy. Does the PYP curriculum have any learning about business? <laughs> I think Ms. Lisha is going to be able to answer that one very well. Uh, um, I think they will... It's not business per se, but they do talk about, you know, products around you. Like, like just now, you, you look at how my daughter was uh, had to analyze a product. You know, she's in grade two. She doesn't know anything about business. But at the same time, you know, you, she had to choose a product you like, like ice cream. So she had to find out, you know, where's the ice cream made? What, what do they do? Where's the factory located? If the factory is not here, how was the factory? And then um, my son did learn about, um, they, they did learn about, Bit trade, they learn about trade in grade three. They did learn about the barter system and then the history of money and how um, the trade, how trade functions, what is import, export. He did a whole fact sheet and a cheat sheet on money. And they learn about, in maths, they learn about currencies and conversions. And also, um, yeah, so they, there is a certain element. And then in, in Chinese class, he learned about all the terms in Mandarin relating to trade. So they do learn a very basic, not, not the way you would say like money management kind of trade or like really big business, but they have some unpacking of some uh, elements relating to trade. What is butter? How did it, how did money evolve in the history of money? So they do go into that. And then in English, they learn about the Silk Road, you know, how, 
how people travel the Silk Road to trade products and the evolution of that. So there's some interesting elements relating to trade. Um, not, tra not the very traditional style of thing, but I do believe in uh, older, when they move older, they to older grade, uh, upper grades, they do unpack it again in a different way where it's related to um, things like proper business, uh, right? Vincent, I'm not, I haven't reached there yet. So maybe Dr. Vincent can respond to that. And late, later on, they do do other things with money and, and yeah. specific with things in uh, social studies. Uh, but I think, yeah, um, I think it's, it's what you've described is really appropriate. It's actually the basics of business that gets shared in the PYP, the primary years, because it's, I don't know what the rush is with people sometimes. Like it's, it's not necessary to go that fast. Kids need to stay kids to enjoy the world, to explore it in all its craziness and wonder. <laughs> uh, they will have to learn about money at some point. Yes, we do do that in the later years, but not in the primary school, not that heavy. Um, but they can wait for that. It's okay. Thank you, Ms. Lishan and Dr. Vincent. It's really impressive at their young age, they're learning trading already. Okay, next, we have another question. What age groups do the students go to OBS camp and international camps? That is question from LN. They start in primary three, uh, so primary four, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. um, all the way up to the diploma program. So uh, primary four, it really depends. Uh, the age groups can really vary a little bit. If I'm not mistaken, it's somewhere about eight, eight years old. Yeah. Uh, eight. It's our youngest at primary four. And that can range up to 10 years old as well. Eight to 10, yeah. Yeah. We call them our Port Dixon, uh, Port Dixon camps, not OBS. OBS is a trade name for Outward Brown School. It's just that most people know that word. That's why I used mm. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. Next, we have another question from Mr. Sarov. Thank you for your reply, Dr. Vincent. Another question. This is my first exposure to IB program. My first two children did IGCSE and SPM. They both eventually completed their A-levels. I'd like to know if IB is acceptable to all universities, yeah. especially in the UK and Australia, or only certain university? Um, I think the easy way to say this is the IB is probably the world's most highly recognized pre-university program out there. Yeah. If you take a kid who has done the IB and a kid who has done the A-levels and you fire both of them at university, I know which one the, the university is going to prefer, mm -hmm. and that's the IB. Now, if you want to know the specifics about the IB, we actually do a, a DP talk uh, very specifically to explain why I make such a crazy allegation that the IB is more recognized than every other qualification, including the A-levels. Well, I'll give you one statistic. Out of 100 students, A-level students, that apply to the top 20 universities in the UK, 22 will get in. Out of 100 IB students that apply to the top 22, 20 universities in the UK, 40 will get in. That's a fact. All right. And that tells you IB students are getting in at double the rate of A-level students. Now, draw from that what you need to draw. That's, that's factual information. And if you, if you can do that in the UK, where the A-levels is from, imagine what is going to happen in Australia in the US, in Canada, they all love the IB, um, including Europe right now. And Singapore loves it as well. Several of their elite colleges have all shifted out from the A-levels into the IB, like ACS and SOTA. Uh, they, don't, they don't bother with the A-levels anymore. So why are the rest of us bothering with it? I'm not sure. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. I, there is another question from Mr. Saroff. What music and sports do you have in Fairview? Do you have tennis, piano? Are these extracurricular activities are inclusive in the school fees or separate? So listen, do you pay extra for your musical education? No, <laughs> the, my children learn violin. I think uh, the short answer is they learn orchestral instruments because they need to learn how to play individually and also in an ensemble. And um, I think orchestral instruments also tend to be a little bit more difficult to pick up also. So I think the skills that they learn, the core skills that they learn surround, 
uh, relating to picking up an orchestral instrument is very valuable for them. So no extra, but but you know I do send them you know for extra piano lesson. But the violin really helps a lot because it kind of like complements it. So it's up to you. You can do the extra if you want, but you don't have to. It's all inclusive. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you can learn the piano right. anywhere. Thank you, you want. so much. Thank you, Dr. Vincent and Lucien, for the explanation. Um, uh, very insightful. Um, I'm surprised to know that IB is well acceptable in uh, Ivy Leagues as well around the world. Um, yeah. That's news to me. Yeah, um, you can go. Um, you, Zara, you can go to the IBO uh, organization uh, website. They will even have a lot of uh, testimonial videos for, of deans from IB League schools who tell oh, yeah. you about why they prefer IB. They, they are videos of them. <laughs> so you okay. can check those out. Yeah. I'll definitely consider for my daughter. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Saro, for your questions. Okay, if you have any questions, please, our speakers are still ready to answer all your questions. I think the, the asked question about sports, right? Um, sports that you have. Just now, I think Dr. Vincent said we basketball, we have swimming, we have, is it football? There's some football, yeah. football also. And ten you don't, tennis. You don't have tennis, do you? No. <laughs> Sorry. That's one of the we, we try to focus on like big group activity sports rather than the individual ones. Uh because yeah. we're really trying to develop that sense of teamwork in our kids. Because uh, I'm a tennis player, so my daughter oh, I've been okay. encouraging her to play tennis and I think she's picking up quite well. So I'd okay. like her to continue with that. But unfortunately uh, you don't, don't have tennis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can't have everything. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, we have one more, I think. I believe. Um, thank you, Dr. Vincent and Ms. Lishan. I believe that is the last question. No, no, we got one more. Uh, Ellen, just put one more. Oh, uh, okay. Do you want to yes. just ask that straight off, Ellen? Uh, maybe unmute yourself and ask it. It'd be nice to hear your voice. <laughs> okay. Ellen. Okay. Uh, never mind. I I'll just, I I'll can just help. go through it. Yeah, I can help. Okay, question from Ellen. What is the focus in MYP? Um, higher grade years normally become more specialized in subjects. Is it still very much cross subject? Mm. So in we have uh, three uh, we have three terms that we need to understand. The first one is called disciplinary. It's where you learn math as math and don't connect to anything else. Math is math. This is called siloed learning. Um, this is a problem of all companies, you know, like the marketing department doesn't want to talk to the finance department. It's because they don't believe that they, they need to connect with anybody else. And the problem is actually starts in school. We learn math as math, English and, as English, and neither the twain shall ever meet. Okay, then I'm going to teach you two more words. And these are tough words, but follow me a bit. Transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary. Very easy to understand. Transdisciplinary means that we connect all the subjects at the same time. Okay, that's trans. And this interdisciplinary means we connect two or three subjects at the same time. We do transdisciplinary in the primary years program, and then we do interdisciplinary in the middle years program and the diploma program. So what does trans mean? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you had one example, I'm gonna give another one. Yep. The theme is uh, about, you know, hospitals maybe. Okay, so we're gonna learn about hospitals uh, and, when we learn English, we learn descriptive writing about, you know, okay, what kids, what do you see in the hospital? Uh, imagine you're in the ER, do a descriptive writing about that. Okay, in math, okay, it's, it's, uh, the doctor can see 50, one patient every 15 minutes and there are this number of pe people coming in. How long will it take for him to clear the, clear the list? So again, connecting to mm. the same theme. We can even bring in social sciences about, oh no, the doctor uh, has a problem about uh, deciding on who to operate on. How does he make that decision? Uh, how much does each cost? Do we understand the dynamics of hospitals and the nature of the medical uh, insurance industry and how everybody can't pay for things? So that'll be an INS conversation and totally easy to connect Mandarin or BM into mm. that or arts into that. So that's transdisciplinary, connecting everything through a common theme. The common themes you like to use are who are we in, uh, uh, who, am, who am I? Where are we in space and time? Uh, then there's a couple of other, you know, key. How we express ourselves and how the world works, how we organize ourselves and sharing the planet. 
Thank you, Lisa. I'm not so busy <laughs> anymore, isn't it? No, it's okay. Uh, I saw, uh, I'm reading off a list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so transdisciplinary connects all subjects simultaneously and it teaches our kids not to be siloed. Now, interdisciplinary is different. In the middle years program, they connect two or three subjects at any one time. They don't connect all of it because it's, the information is a lot more technical and mm. much more complicated. So they have these things called IDUs, interdisciplinary units, special subjects that they, every child goes through twice in a year where they purposely connect two subjects together. So the lessons happen simultaneously. The teachers jump into each other's classes. The assessment requires the use of both kinds of knowledge at the same time. Just think geometry uh, and uh, art where they start using, there's a certain art form, they, they use a lot of shapes as well into it. Mm. Um, and that's the classic one I, I remember they do in the, the first year of middle years school. With the, That's an art and math connection. Then they do a lot of other things like the science and the English connections as well. Great con con subject connections. And that's how they, they connect these two dots together. I have a big, big gripe about people who teach subjects alone individually because that teaches kids math is only used in math class. English is only used in English class. Uh, I don't need to use English in math class or science class, yeah? So grammar is not important when I do English. Mm. And when you go to work, it obviously doesn't work that way. Life is yeah. all messy and mixed up. So why are we separating it? So yeah. fantastic question, uh, Ellen. Uh, love that question about you know, bring out the transdisciplinary concepts over there. Beautiful. Yeah. I, so I can give you another example. I think like, like if you did like uh, world leaders, literature, you can read uh, like... Uh, biography you know and then data you maths you can study data on uh, world leadership and then for science you can talk about nature or nurture so it can be like that also right yeah, yeah. the interdisciplinary kind of thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's why older parent told me <laughs> um so we have one more question about how are children assessed in each grade oh okay right now let's let's do this one as simply as possible if, you gave, if I gave you an art piece to do, and you say, I draw a house, and you gave me a house of drawing, and then I gave you a 70%, which is the classic way of grading in the, the traditional education systems. Do you have any idea what 70% means? Like, what, what is 70%? What am I supposed to do with that? If it's 70% good, 30% bad, what, what is that? Um, it doesn't make any sense. But if I gave you a rubric, so that's kind of like a table, which says a one is like this. A one has to have... Uh, uh, outline of a house. Uh, with a two, you draw a bit of the sky. With a three, you have the, 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 the picket fence in and the colors are in. Four, you add the shading. And then I gave you a three. Then you look at this table and you say, oh, I got a three. I didn't do the shading. That's why I didn't get a four. This mm. is called a rubric, right? And a rubric uh, is how we assess across all of our subjects. We don't use percentages because they don't mean very much. Um, and that's a very, very important concept that we use that is very important for parents to grasp. Why yeah. do you allow your children to be marked on a one point, two point? Does that actually mean anything? It, it, it's too granular. It doesn't, it doesn't come together in a meaningful way. Whereas rubrics, I think Lisa and you shared that you yeah. know, the report card is full of rubrics and we give advice about, look, if you're a five and you want to get to a six, these are the things you do to get to a yeah. six. So report cards are not just about where you are and you're so bad and all that. It's about what do you do, practical steps, to move to the next step. That's good quality feedback coming through there. Uh, and that's, that's assessments. Typically, the, the assessment is very informed. They have a written assessment in each grade twice a year. So it's paper and pen still. We don't do away with that. And they also have projects, group work, presentations, artwork, uh, essays, all sorts of funny things can turn up, models even. Uh, cause why can't you present like a, you know, pre why can't you show your understanding of a subject in an art form? What's yeah. wrong with that? Yeah. Uh, Lisa, do you want to add any further about that? Yeah. Um, maybe to even make it more granular, like, um, I think for younger grades, we have this thing like the formative assessments and the summative assessment, like what Dr. Vincent described, the summative assessments, you do them at the end of every big semester, right? Two, sem two terms, right? Every term. But the formative assessments also happen during the unit that they're learning to assess whether the child, is not to test the child, is to assess the child's understanding of that 
you need in that point in time how much of, do they understand and maybe how much the teacher needs to supplement to sort of help the child reach a better understanding the the formative assessment then only at the end of the unit you have a summative assessment which it has all the rubrics and then you know the child has to see what what they can do based on the rubrics and then at the end of every term you have a big report and of course at the end of the year is a is a report that summarizes everything and then it even talks about the other aspect like the learner profiles and and things that the child is displaying and could be displaying more of that you can work on fantastic thank you so much for that lisan welcome <laughs> i have limited limited exposure to it but a little bit okay <laughs> okay thank you dr vincent and miss lishan i believe that is really the last question for now <laughs> unless they want to throw more questions to us yeah okay. one more okay so we have another one how do students coming from igcse adjust to ib at myp level what kind of typical challenges that they faced have you observed? That is a horrible question. Because um, I'm going to have to share about what's the problems that I see with uh, traditional education. The biggest problem I, we see is the child comes to class and he cannot grasp with the fact that there isn't one right answer. They get very irritated because of that. They're like, uh, teacher, teacher, but what's the answer? Well, what do you think is the answer? Show me your thinking. No, 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 no. Just tell me what is the right answer. You know, the one that you get one point from? No, 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 no. no. Uh, just show me how you're thinking about it. I want to hear your thoughts. No, 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 teacher. What's the one right answer that gets me the one point? Like, a lot of kids can't, they can't get beyond that. Or, uh, teacher, teacher, what do I have to memorize for the exam? Huh? Uh, which pages do I do? No, I really shared with you the PowerPoint. I've shared with you the concept that we need to learn. You have your notes. You've written down the key concepts. You need to study around those and really understand those. No, 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 no. Uh, teacher, teacher, which, which page of the textbook do I have to memorize? Okay, that's another classic problem that they have. Uh, and then the, the third one, I remember this very clearly. Dr. Vincent, Dr. Vincent, your teacher's a bad teacher. I said, why? During the revision time, the questions that he went through in there, it didn't come out in the exam. I sat to myself thinking, are you mad? What is wrong with this situation? Of course, if I gave you the questions that's coming out in the exam, isn't that called cheating? But then I thought back to myself, wait a second. That's what I went through as a kid, right? These are all the classic bad habits that have been drilled into our kids for you know, 10, 11 years of their life. And then you send them over to the MYP and I've got to untrain them with all of these horrible habits. That's the big problem. Uh, to get them to let go of one right answer, to understand that they're not, that let go of the false security of memorizing a couple of pages for an exam, to let go of the expecting of the cheating, that artificial forced examination preparation. These are the three big bad habits that really find, the kids really find it hard to break out of. Typically, I'd say most MYP kids, they take about six months to break out of it. Most of them, six months, they can break out of it. And thank God when they do, because, you know, if kids have to grow up for the rest of their life with these bad habits, can you imagine what would happen to them as adults? Hey, boss, can you tell me what's the answers on the big presentation with the client? The boss will fire you on the spot. Hey, boss, what do I unlearn, uh, memorize for the product manual? Which pages do I read? Oh my gosh, boss will definitely fire you already. So none of that makes any sense in the real world. Uh, and those are the things that really... Um, they're the biggest problems that we see for kids transitioning over from the uh, middle years program. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincent and Ms. Lishan. I believe that is really the final question for today. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to thank each of you for being with us today. And we would love you to be part of our Fairview International School community. Please leave us a message and please visit our website, which is posted in our chat group. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day.